Hi there, Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well. Thank you for watching Brother Be Well's Youth Substance Youth Prevention Series, supported by Elevate Youth California, funded through Proposition 64. And Roland, you talked about how addictive uh, these prescription drugs are. And again, we've got a whole separate conversation talking about cocaine and heroin, but these prescription drugs are really addictive. Can you quickly walk us through what the risk factors are for addiction? Some of us are more predisposed to addiction than others, I understand. So can you quickly walk us through that? Yeah, real quickly. So one, there is a genetic predisposition. So it's a nature versus nurture argument. Some people have the biological makeup that once they use a substance, it releases a, um, an exaggerated amount of dopamines and endorphins, the chemicals that make you feel good. It's, they release more in that brain than they do in a person that does not have that genetic predisposition. So that's the nature argument. Like you can inherit addictive qualities just like you inherit blue eyes or freckles or red hair. Um, the second argument is that it's nature, that people actually you can smoke yourself into cancer. You can screw yourself into uh, uh, venereal disease. You can eat yourself into diabetes. So you can use enough that you become addicted to whatever. And the, it's the indications that a person is becoming addicted primarily is that they're not using in social situations for fun. They're using because they think the drug changes them, makes them better, enhances them, takes away pain, gives them a voice, gives them energy, et cetera. There's a payoff for using the drug. And over time, People, once they find out drugs do that, then they use it more often. So they use drugs to cope with everyday life situations. Every time I get sad, I drink. Every time I want to celebrate, I drink or use. I use the social lubricant I use for pain relief, et cetera. If you keep using like that, you know, because those social, those challenging situations are recurring in the everyday life, you will wind up using more often. And in the opioid, uh, you wind up becoming dependent on it, as I said, to develop a tolerance. And then the uh, criteria that we use is that people are using despite no negative consequences. They know that it's causing a problem. They use anyway. They know that they could get kicked out of school, lose their job, lose their relationship, but they still use, even though they know it's a problem. They know it's illegal, even and, and they still use. They develop the tolerance that I talked about. They start to have the withdrawal. They start to experience loss of control. They can't predict how much they're going to use once they start. Um, um, and so those are some of the primary symptoms that you start, what we call in Chicago, you start leaking. You know, it starts to leak into other areas of your life. Yeah. And you have negative, you have negative consequences like financial, social, relationship, medical, legal, et cetera. And you continue to use, you develop a dependence on it. You can't stop because you get sick when you stop. So you use and use and use. That's the yeah. problem. I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful. And then I want to just touch base with our youth, Roland. I got to tell you, I, I, have, I have had a father who was an alcoholic. And I, he, he told me once, everything you said word for word was pretty much what he told me about alcohol. And when he saw me drinking a little bit too much, he said, don't drink to celebrate. Don't drink when you're sad. Don't drink when you're mad because you're going to try to drink your way through the problem and the problems keep coming. So it's 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 he, he was he was teaching me a little bit about what we're talking about. And I didn't even realize I was so young when he told me that. But you just reminded me of that that mm -hmm. single conversation he had. Uh, Aldo, Devante, anything to share there? I want to I want to ask Roland next about uh, medication assistant treatment. But before I do that, I just want to touch base with y'all. Anything you want to add? To what Roland just had to say. Yeah, real quickly. Um, I mean, it's 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 a lot of information to take in. It's a lot yeah. of um, you know, things to process. And how I view it personally is, um, I actually had a friend not too long ago. I think this was like less than a year ago. But um, I have a few friends who are roommates. They live in Sacramento. They go to school there. And I think it was like over the summer in May or right before the summertime, uh, one of my friends noticed that and, and, and her roommate, which is my friend, another guy, uh, was finishing like painkillers and was like, you know, taking them and, you know, whatever he was going through, it, it's hurtful and, and it, it sucks to hear that. But she didn't know what to do. 
she didn't know how to speak to him. She didn't know who to reach out to, whether it's family, whether it's him directly or his friends. And I felt the same way. I, I couldn't believe it. And I didn't know how to approach him or what to say. But being involved in these type of conversations, being involved in a program like this, Brother Be Well, being, you know, um, being educated by Roland or by Michael, um, it's giving me the tools to, you know, if it happens again, or if I know someone or a family member, I know how to how to go about it. I know the facts. I know probably what they're thinking about. I know the withdrawal symptoms and all those things. So that's, that's what I have to say about this. Appreciate it. Thanks to Roland. We know what to look for in somebody using. He's taught us a lot already. Taught us a lot already. Let, let me get into this question about medication-assisted treatment. I know you've got some strong feelings about it, Roland. Some people think that, that that's the way to go. If someone is addicted to uh, opioids, you use some type of medication, at least in the short term, to help them wean off of that. Why don't you think that medication-assisted treatment is a good long-term solution for people that are struggling with opioid addiction? Well, I think in some way, well, first of all, let me say that I, I advocate for medication-assisted treatment um, with, with, with certain conditions. I remember when, and mostly when they say medication-assisted treatment, they're talking about different drugs, not just the opioid replacement drugs. Um, like um, um, like buprenorphine, like Suboxone and Subutex or Methadone. Those are those are just treating one opiate for another one. There are other drugs like now Traxone, and um, um, that is a, a, a blocks the opiate receptor site, so you don't feel any opiate because it's not an opiate. And there's medication assisted drugs for alcohol, like um, and abuse and and for nicotine. But particularly in relation to this conversation, I think that the opioid um, replacement, apparently the solution to the opioid epidemic was more opioids. And I think that the big pharmacy has gotten involved in that. And you never really know, there's often a concern about a conflict of interest when doctors are prescribing people these, these low-grade opioids like Suboxone and Subutex. And people will tell you that those aren't a drug, just ask them to try to stop taking it. So if you don't think that's addictive, try to stop taking it. I've detoxed tons of people. I put tons of people in, in treatment because trying to come off of those drugs that were supposed to help them stay off of drugs. They get to a point where they don't like it and they want to come off of it. And they're very, very difficult to come off of. I think they're great to get to. You said it when you first started. They're great for short term, in my opinion. And I'm biased. I'm old school. I'm 36 years in this business. And I come from an abstinence-based model. Now they're really kind of insisting that everybody have the option, almost like it's inhumane, inhumane, that it's prehistoric, that it's antiquated, that it's ineffective. This whole notion that opiate addicts can get clean and be abstinent, that they don't need, that they can go through the normal anxiety and cravings and all of that that happens when you give up any drug without giving them another drug to manage that. You know, when I've been in the rooms, when people don't know my history and they're making policies about, you know, these guys can't make it. They need to be on these drugs. It's not fair to them that you would make them go through life without having to deal with this anxiety and these cravings. And I'm in the room telling them, look, I'm a heroin addict. I've been clean 36 years. I know a whole bunch of people like me that did that. So as much as you promote that medication-assisted treatment saves lives, you equally need to promote that abstinence-based treatment saves lives too. There's a place for each one of them. So for some people, you know, when, when people come to treatment, they're coming looking for opioids. I want the program that's going to give me some, some um, Suboxone or Subutex. I think they're great for detox. I think they're great for maybe short term. But the idea of keeping people on these medications for years indefinitely to help them avoid feeling what are normal, appropriate feelings, I'm not too crazy about that idea. Greetings. My name is Tex Wambui. I am from South Sacramento, California. It has been a blessing to be in a daily discourse with other brothers. The conversations have been robust, stimulating, and engaging. I have learned the importance of perspective, the value of self-care, the significance of mental well-being, the different ways of being a beacon for myself and community. On top of that, I have gained wisdom from experienced individuals that have enlightened me and the other brothers on topics such as substance abuse, different forms of therapy, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, in short, the DSM, and more importantly, life skills of how to grow and maintain character as a professional, student, son, and brother. I would like to conclude by thanking each person that was involved with the Summer Academy for Brother Be Well. 
In addition, I would like to give a special shout out to Justin Martinez, Connor Crump, Christopher Jacobs, Roland Williams, Michael Coleman, and the behind the scenes team for always being ready on providing us with the best experience with information. It kind of sucks that I won't be in a space with my fellow brothers, but I am excited to grow from the experience we all shared as we embarked on the journey. I am thankful for the Summer Academy, and I look forward to learning more from the program and supporting and ensuring we can grow, sustain, and maintain the youth because our future is dependent on what we do today for ourselves and each other. As always, brothers, be well.